Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Iran begins war games in Persian Gulf oil route. Sudan election results delayed. And Netanyahu amenable to Palestinian state within temporary borders. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. On the second day of Iran's military maneuvers in the Arabian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, it tested new military electronic systems. Details from Iran in report by Milham Rayan. For the second consecutive day, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's military maneuvers continued in preparation to face the presumed enemy. The focus of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's testing of new systems in electronic warfare is an attempt to foil the element of surprise for Iran's enemies. The objective is to train on detecting any military activities in the area. Iran's presumed enemies are only Israel and America. This is what the Iranian Revolutionary Guard said to the Qatari military delegation that was invited to attend the military maneuvers. Some believe that this invitation was aimed at undermining the concerns of neighboring Arab states over these military maneuvers. In fact, we are happy to participate in these military maneuvers. Qatar received an official invitation. We are here to observe these military maneuvers. The objective is to strengthen the bilateral relations between the two countries, which are already strong. Also, the objective is an exchange of expertise between the Islamic Republic and Qatar. This is the first time a foreign delegation attends a military maneuver by the Revolutionary Guards, and that sends numerous messages. Most important of which is that the military maneuvers are not a threat to Arab countries, as stated by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Therefore, holding joint military maneuvers with neighboring Arab states is a possibility in the future. Although some believe that this is hard to do amid American pressure in the region and the threats against Iran. Amidst the American escalation, the possibility of using the war option to deal with Iran's nuclear program seems likely. The enemies must learn a lesson from what happened in the Tabas Desert in the past. I advise them to go back to reason. Their threats are not useful. We want peaceful nuclear development, which is our right. Iran is willing to take on more sanctions rather than compromise this right. Perhaps Iran is also willing to endure the costs of a military confrontation. Iran is showing off its uh, military might with major drills in the Persian Gulf and the strategic Strait of Hormuz. The exercises have now entered their second day. Let's get you updated. Naval, air and ground units from Iran's Islamic Revolution Guard Corps are taking part in the exercises, dubbed Great Prophet 5. The second day of the drills includes complicated operations involving mine-carrying divers and rocket-launching vessels. Today our divers carry out special exercises with mines. We are also entering the two-day tactical phase which involves interception drills by light vessels, rocket launchers, missile launchers and vessels capable of firing torpedoes. Friday's maneuvers showcase the latest military achievements of the IRGC's ground forces. The Islamic Revolution Guard's Corps also successfully tested home-built drones that have the capability to detect and intercept intruding aircraft. <laughs> Over
over 300 torpedo and guided missile vessels participated in the first day of the drills. A delegation of Qatari military officials also visited the region where the maneuvers are taking place. The Qatari officials expressed hope that the drills will help improve security in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, a narrow waterway where some four-tenths of the world's seaborne oil deliveries pass through. Well, the United States says it has won Chinese support for new sanctions against Iran over its nuclear energy program. This is Beijing has repeatedly rejected such punitive measures against Tehran. Here's a report. U.S. Vice President Joe Biden says China will agree to more U.S. proposed sanctions against Iran. He also expects the new measures to take effect by May. Biden says Washington will continue to keep pressuring Tehran over its nuclear energy program. This as China, a veto-wielding permanent member of the U.N. Security Council, has firmly opposed new sanctions on Iran. On Tuesday, the Chinese foreign ministry described dialogue and negotiations as the best way to settle the West's standoff with Iran over its nuclear program. This as the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany have failed to reach consensus on the issue. Tehran has already been subjected to three rounds of US-sponsored UN sanctions. Iran says the punitive measures have accelerated the development of its industrial sector. Moreover, analysts believe further sanctions against Iran will be counterproductive. Most analysts realize that sanctions are in reality going to be counterproductive because it's going to put Iran's back against the wall and um, Iran will sort of retreat into a, into a fortress Iran position, if you like. It'll, it'll, it'll look to itself rather than to its na neighbors in the world, in the wider world community. So it's, it's not an effective way forward. Iran says it seeks nuclear energy to meet its growing need for electricity. Tehran, a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, strongly rejects allegations by Washington and its allies that it's seeking atomic bombs. But the United States has escalated pressure on Iran to make it halt its nuclear program. Iran says the U.S. has even implicitly threatened it with a nuclear attack. Tehran has made it clear that it will not be intimidated by such threats and will continue to seek its right to peaceful nuclear energy. Salah Habebe, spokesperson for the Sudanese Electoral Commission, told the BBC that announcing the results of the presidential elections necessitates properly tallying the votes from all Sudanese states and from abroad. To win, candidates need to have 50 percent plus one. We we'll leave you with our reporter, Adel Mahroub from Khartoum. The winner is Malik Akkar from the People's Movement for the Liberation of Sudan, the number of votes being 1,819. Some believe that these results are important, but the final results are considered to be the most important. We are referring here to the announcement of the winners of the two most important political posts in Sudan today. The president of the country, and the Prime Minister of the South Sudanese government. The announcement did not happen on time. The Electoral Commission did not specify a time for the announcement of the final results. Instead, it said that the announcement of the final results will be postponed for technical reasons. Within 48 hours, all the information pertaining to the votes for the President of Sudan and the Prime Minister of the Southern Sudanese government will be transferred from the south of Sudan. When do you think the announcement will be made? I think that the announcement will be made sometime after Sunday or maybe Saturday. However, we have now received all the results from the northern states and from abroad. Others, however, believe that the elections were postponed for political reasons and not only for the technical reasons, as the Electoral Commission stated. Of course there are clear political considerations. It is not only about tallying the vote. There are other political considerations for which the results are not being announced. This has been the case since the first day of the elections. I think that what happened in the Blue Nile is very clear. Regardless of the final result of the elections, there has been a great deal of political activity in Sudan in preparations for the post-election era, such as the visit of Sudan's deputy president. Many do not expect surprises in the results of the elections, but making an official announcement is still important. Adel Mujab, BBC, Al Khartoum.
وبرغم ذلك جولة جديدة محملة بالبنود والأهداف القادمة. In a surprise visit that began last night, U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East George Mitchell brought another package of both old and new agendas to the occupied territories. جدول أعمال الدبلوماسية الأمريكية. The U.S. diplomat schedule began this morning in occupied Jerusalem with intense meetings with Israeli Defense Minister Ehud Barak. It is presumed that Mitchell would meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu afterwards, then go to Ramallah and meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. The announced goal of Mitchell's new visit has changed, which is part of the U.S. attempt to relaunch the obstructed peace negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. This goal has sparked tension between Washington and Tel Aviv, when Israel recently insisted on its settlement policy in Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reaffirmed this policy just hours before Mitchell's arrival. Netanyahu reiterated Israel's refusal to freeze settlement construction in East Jerusalem and to accept any preconditions to resume negotiations with the Palestinians. At the same time, he announced his acceptance of the establishment of a Palestinian state with temporary borders as a means for Israel to return to the negotiation table. I stress my one position. I will not accept any freeze in Jerusalem, and we will not accept any preconditions for resuming the negotiations. As for their demands on this matter, I believe that it has become clear that we will never compromise our position. So they should compromise their demands. This does not necessarily mean that the U.S. agrees with us on this issue. Joining us directly from occupied Jerusalem is our correspondent Mohammed Saad. Mohammed, Mitchell is in the region today to meet with Israeli and Palestinian officials, and once again, Netanyahu openly refuses to freeze the settlements. How will this continuous Israeli refusal affect the negotiations? First of all, there are no negotiations between Palestine and Israel. There are United States attempts which appear to be serious this time, to resume the negotiations between the two sides, perhaps indirectly. As Netanyahu said before Mitchell's visit, as he always does, he will absolutely not stop building settlements in occupied Jerusalem. At the same time, he said to the media that he will recognize a Palestinian state with temporary borders. He and his government have made nothing new in this Israeli position, on the contrary, Israel always stressed that same position. George Mitchell is meeting with Israeli Defense Minister Ehud Barak first, then he will meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, then talks with Israeli President Shimon Peres. Afterwards, he will leave for Ramallah, where he will meet with President Mahmoud Abbas. Over there, of course, everyone is waiting to see what George Mitchell will bring from his meetings in Israel. So far, there has been nothing new at all on this subject. On the contrary, Israel reiterated the same position, which is the necessity of continuing settlements in the West Bank and Jerusalem. As for the Palestinian state, you do not see Israel even discussing this topic in its talks with the United States. And now, it wants direct negotiations with Palestine on the condition that Jerusalem will be excluded from the negotiations. So we are talking about negotiations. If they were to happen, they are going to be held without talking about Jerusalem, without talking about permanent borders, refugees, water, and and all the other issues pertaining to the final solution. So these will be manipulated negotiations serving Israel's interest. Well, Israel is reportedly saying no to the U.S. demand for a construction freeze of Jewish housing in eastern Jerusalem. Sources in the Prime Minister's office say Israel will probably not issue an official answer, but will instead try to reach an understanding with Washington. IBA's Eli Wargalanter has that story. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has reportedly given U.S. President Barack Obama a response to the demands made in the March 23rd meeting between the two heads of state. It was widely reported that Obama's main request was to freeze all construction in the Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem amid American pressure on Israel to make gestures and concessions 
to enable indirect peace talks with the Palestinians. According to a report in today's Wall Street Journal, the Prime Minister has rejected the U.S. request on East Jerusalem, but has agreed to discuss nearly a dozen other points that were raised in talks between the parties. These include the release of Palestinian prisoners, a lift of the blockade on the Gaza Strip, the removal of roadblocks in the West Bank, the issue of borders, and Jerusalem's status. Netanyahu reportedly also agreed to stop construction in Ramat Shlomo for two years. The Prime Minister's office said the response conveyed to the Americans is part of a process of ongoing dialogue aimed at promoting the peace process. However, the sources stressed that Netanyahu's stance, as presented in an interview to ABC earlier this week, has not changed. The issue of Jerusalem would be discussed and will be discussed in the final settlement negotiations. But to bring it forward, to say that these neighborhoods that are part and parcel of, of Jerusalem, they're not isolated hilltops in the West Bank. They're about four minutes drive from here. About 200,000 Israelis live there. The Ramot Shlomo neighborhood that was uh, in the news was populated by Yitzhak Rabin. He wasn't against peace. Neither were all the other prime ministers, including until a year ago, that were building in these neighborhoods, these Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem, and the Palestinians were negotiating peace with them. This demand that they've now introduced the Palestinians to stop all construction, Jewish construction in Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem, is totally, totally a non-start. U.S. National Security Advisor James Jones expressed disappointment last night that Israel and the Palestinians have not opened direct negotiations. Said Jones, it is time to begin those negotiations and to put an end to excuses. It is time for today's leaders to demonstrate the courage and leadership of Anwar Sadat, King Hussein, and Yitzhak Rabin. Jones said peace between Israel and the Palestinians would neutralize the threat of terror and the Iranian nuclear threat. The dialogue between Israel and the Obama administration is to continue next week when Defense Minister Ayad Barak visits Washington. Talks could resume even earlier, as the latest reports indicate that Special Envoy George Mitchell might be arriving in the region today. Ellie Wogelanter, IBA News. Mr. Jihad Magdisi, Damascus refutes the claims that it provided Hezbollah with Scud missiles, saying that these claims are aimed at creating tension. Some say that talks about the armaments tend to be ambiguous, but Syria was not ambiguous. Syria has clearly denied these allegations, and it has done that unequivocally to send a message. <coughs> the objective behind Syria's position is not only to deny the allegations. If you were to read the whole Syrian statement, you would realize that it denied and refuted the claims. We distributed the statement to all Syrian embassies around the world, and they also distributed this statement. The objective is to create an awakening in public opinion and with policymakers. The Syrian position was aimed at showing that tension is being increased in order to pave the way for another Israeli aggression. We are not talking about a country of angels. This country thrives on aggression. There are internal, regional and international indications that Netanyahu's government may commit another stupid act. We decided to deny the claims and explain to everyone the Israeli agenda behind these claims. We want to tell everyone, stop dealing with Israeli narratives as if they were real. Have we forgotten last year when the Israeli delegation to the United Nations distributed a CD of aerial images allegedly showing Hezbollah transporting ballistic missiles? Al-Manar television embarrassed Israel by broadcasting enlarged copies of these images showing that water tubes were actually being transported, not missiles. Do you remember that? This happened last year and the Israeli delegation was embarrassed by this silliness. However, at the time, Israel managed to convince the Security Council to hold an emergency meeting. Why do we believe the Israeli narratives? These narratives should not be trusted. Western policymakers should become more familiar with the Middle East and should deal with issues in a serious manner. Israel must be disciplined, and this is the leading country's responsibility. This includes United Nations Security Council members and Israel's allies. Some believe that Hezbollah already has medium-range missiles that can reach the city of Beya al-Saba in southern Israel. So Scud missiles are not that important, which means that the claims were specifically aimed at Syria. Does the Syrian government feel that way? 
You and everyone can see that Netanyahu must be in need of some tranquilizers. He says to himself, I am the leader of Israel that everyone is afraid of. Through pro-Israeli lobby groups, Israel has strong strategic relations with Western countries, but Israel has a crisis in its relations with Turkey, United States, Britain and Australia. Meanwhile, Netanyahu looks at Syria and sees President Assad achieving a diplomatic victory. In all modesty, we have managed to diversify our relations with countries in the West and the East, including Turkey and the Balkans. There is also European openness towards Syria, and it is helpful for Syrian interests. The United States will send an ambassador to Syria. It is just a matter of time, and it is part of Obama's dialogue policy. Do you expect Netanyahu to be comfortable? I am sure that he and his aides must be in need for some tranquilizers. In Iran's latest internal crisis, Kiwan al qadurzi an activist in the reformist leader Mir Hussein Musavi's campaign, was killed and his body was tossed on the street. The Bill of Reform website accused parties within the authority of killing the student activist. Meanwhile, Musavi made a rare move and met with the leaders of the liberation movement of Iran, who have been under house arrest since before the presidential elections. <laughs> Iranian reformist leader Mir Hussein Mousavi stressed that the path to achieving their goals and accomplishing change is a long and difficult one. In a remarkable move, Mousavi met with the leaders of the liberal religious movement, who have been under house arrest since before the presidential elections. Mousavi reiterated that the reformist movement will continue protesting to get the country out of its current crisis and meet the people's lawful demands. Musavi said that the path to achieving those goals is long, difficult and full of hardships and must be taken with patience and integrity. Musavi described the allegations of the reformist connection to any foreign powers as repetitive. He responded to the allegations by saying that everyone should know that they are working in the nation's best interest and not their own, and that therefore they must stand by the wronged and challenge the unjust. Musavi also mentioned the prisoners in even prison and demanded their release, saying that the continued arrests will not weaken the desire for change. Political prisoners in the even prison announced a hunger strike in order to have their demands met. The prisoners made five demands, the most important of which is that they be bailed out until their trials, stating that they have been in custody for more than ten months. Human rights activists denounced the continued arrests, especially of students. وقد نددنا شطون في حقوق الإنسان باستمرار الاعتقالات خصوصا في أوساط الطلبة Mehdi Hashemi Rafsanjani issued a statement on Thursday denying the existence of a warrant for his arrest, which was revealed by the Minister of Intelligence on Wednesday. Rafsanjani said that a specific movement within the regime wants to arrest him to smear his father's reputation. Mehdi Rafsanjani had previously threatened to uncover what he called the scandals of those influential figures in the regime who cling to the authority, saying that they should be afraid of the day his patience runs out. Najah Muhammad Ali, Al Arabiya. Iraqi residents in the villages of Kubaiba and Achana have demanded that the appropriate authorities rescue them from a looming humanitarian crisis in the area. This news comes after several cancer-related cases were reported in the area due to the usage of a neighboring field as a testing ground for U.S. warplanes. <laughs> With flowers and praise, residents of the village of Kabaiba welcome members of the Baghdad satellite channel, not to express joy or pleasure, but to commend the channel on its efforts to address their problems. The residents of Kubaiba and Achana reported a number of infertility and cancer-related cases in the area. 25 people have been diagnosed or killed by cancer. The total population of both villages is nearly 1,800. The village of Kubeba is located nearly 50 kilometers away from Kirkuk. More than 15 cancer cases have been confirmed in the village. 
Several cases of cancer-related illnesses have been reported in the village of Atshana. The residents believe that the increase in the number of cancer cases is related to a special dumping field that is being used for U.S. warplanes. It has been reported that the U.S. Air Force often test fires its munitions prior to carrying out any surveillance or combat operations. Several cancer-related fatalities were reported in the village. Frankly, all the cases are related to this dumping field, which is being used to test fire different types of U.S. weaponry and munitions. I don't believe that the dumping process is part of a military exercise by the U.S. forces. U.S. forces test fire their munitions before carrying out patrol or combat operations. They test fire their weaponry in the area, then they perform their specific military tasks. Several cancer-related cases were reported in our village. We believe that these cases are directly linked to the dumping field in the area. Among the victims are a woman and a girl. You're welcome to come and see them. Also, in the village of Kubaiba, which you visited earlier, there have been reports of cancer-related illnesses. The demands of the local residents are reasonable. All they want from the officials is to help pay for the treatment of the victims. The Baghdad satellite channel was not able to get any closer to the field due to its dangerous toxicity. This is impacting our lives. No one, including officials, visited us. We demand that officials take the matter seriously and plan a visit to the area. We also urge them to help pay for the treatment of the patients. Eight or nine of the 15 people diagnosed with cancer have already died. We demand that the government remove the dumping field from the area. More than 15 cancer cases have been reported in the village. Between 10 and 12 people have already died. Children are among the victims. One may conclude that no one but God will be able to help these people in their ordeal. This is not the only troubling issue facing the residents of this village, as what is hidden beneath is more bitter and even worse. For Baghdad Satellite Channel, Mohammed Dajaf, the village of Kubaiba in the county of Hawija. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.